Hey everyone, how's it going? Forrest here, again with another installment of my complete analysis of all of J.S. Bach's chorale harmonizations. Today we're looking at another harmonization of Befiel du Dina Vega, which translates to Entrust Your Way. This particular harmonization is very interesting. I'd like to read a little bit of an excerpt from the BachChorales.com website. This setting is among six that are attributed to Carl Philippe Emanuel Bach in the 1762 Fash Manuscript, a source which was lost in 1943 and recovered in 2001. Now this chorale, after having read that after my analysis, um, I had my suspicions about why this chorale had a unique profile and didn't really align with the other chorales that I've analyzed. Like, obviously this chorale doesn't compare to, um, or as closely to yesterday and the day before yesterday's chorales. However, um, I think that there are lots of compelling reasons from the harmony that could potentially suggest that this was not composed by Bach. Um, and I'll talk about those when we get to them. It's not going to be the primary focus because this is a Bach chorale. It was composed by a Bach, uh, if not um, Daddy Bach, um, one of his children who in his own right was a very talented composer who contributed quite a lot of music to the classical repertoire. But with that being said, we're just going to hop right into the analysis. This is a doozy of a chorale, lots of harmonic twists and turns and interesting things that, like I said, contribute to the argument that this actually wasn't composed by Bach, which I think it wasn't just based by the way that it, uh, it looks and the way the harmony operates. So one flat in the key signature, we start with D minor, we end with D minor. Um, that's already sort of a telltale of something interesting going on. I think the overall tonality of this chorale is D minor, but we do spend a fair amount of time in F major and A minor as well, interestingly enough. We do start in D minor, um, but we do modulate to the key of F major by the time we cadence, because our first cadence is an imperfect authentic cadence in the key of D minor. We start off with D minor over F actually, which is a 1-6 chord. Right off the bat, four voices moving subdivided chord progression here, E, G, C sharp, and E. That's C sharp diminished over E, 7, 6. And if you've seen this progression in the Bach chorales, you know it's going to be on the other side, D, A, D, and F. If CPE Bach did in fact harmonize this chorale, he studied his father, that's for sure. Um, after our tonic triad here, we have D, G, B flat, and E. I reckon this D is an accented non-chord tone, and it's actually the C sharp that's our chord tone, making this C sharp fully diminished seventh, which would be our seven seven chord in the key of D minor, and then that would resolve where we would expect D minor, D F A and F. Kind of interesting to see a chorale with so much one and seven going on in uh, so early into the chorale. Uh, this is mostly speculative, though. This is not as strong of a case for this not having been composed by Bach, but I do think this D minor is the the gateway to the key of F. It now becomes our sixth chord. We also have a passing seventh in the bass. We then have B flat, F, D, and G. That's G minor seven over B flat, which is two, six, five. Six going to two, six, five is pretty normative, something you would expect in a cadential situation. And as we're closing in on the cadence, we know that Bach loves two, six, five chords. We have some neighbor tones, some anticipations, some non-chord tones in general here that spell C major, C, E, C, and G. It's a five chord, um, C major, which is our dominant in the key of F major, and then we cadence on F, 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 C, and A, our tonic triad. We have this cadential uh, series of chords here, which just consists of one chord followed by a redundant version of the same chord. Interestingly, we go to a key that we wouldn't particularly expect. Uh, we cadence in the key of A minor here, which is unusual, not because of the fact that it's a distant key. Uh, it's actually a key that is adjacent to F on the circle of fifths, but it wouldn't be the first place I would expect to go from F. I mean, I maybe could make an argument that we would go there from D minor, but from F, I don't know. And the way we get there is kind of interesting too. We go from F major to E, G, C, and C. 
which is C major over E5-6. And I think this is our gateway because we get this chromaticism in uh, the bass line here. And we know with chromatic bass lines, we get interesting chord progressions. Um, but this is where we go to the key of A minor. And this now becomes our 3-6 chord. And then I have D, G sharp, F, and B natural, which is G sharp, fully diminished seventh. That is seven, seven, and second inversion. So seven, four, three. And then we get D sharp, C, F sharp, and A. This is D sharp diminished in root position. So this would be a secondary diminished uh, or secondary leading tone chord. Seven, seven of five, because uh, D sharp is the um, leading tone to E, and E is our five chord in the key of A minor. We then have E, B, E, and A. Looks kind of like a one, six, four chord. Uh, I think it's more likely the fact that this is a five chord with this A being a four, three suspension in the melody. So we know that five is being implied. This C is a passing tone as well. The C is sort of what complicates things. Is this a one, six, four chord? Or is this a five chord? I think it's a five chord, but there is an argument to be made that it's also a one, six, four chord, I believe. Um, but we do eventually resolve to five, E, D, E, and G sharp actually turns into a seven, three, a fifthless uh, five chord, um, which is interesting. Yeah, I'll just go ahead and put seven there rather than seven, three. And then we cadence on A minor, A, C, E, and A. So already off the bat, F to going to A minor, not really a key relationship that Bach uses in the chorales. I don't think I've seen that modulation. I'll have to go over the spreadsheet where I've kept track of all of the modulations that have occurred. Don't think we've seen this one, which is um, obviously arises some suspicion. But again, this is more speculative than anything else. Probably one of the more stronger pieces of evidence, though, going from F major to A minor. Like I said, not a distant key relationship, but as far as key relationships are concerned, going from a major key to a minor key that's adjacent on the circle of fifths is kind of um, kind of unusual. Like moving to the the median is unusual. Typically, we would see Bach go to the supertonic or go to the key of the relative minor or the dominant, but he goes to the median, which is unusual. B section starts off in the key of A minor as well, but we're going to go right back to F major pretty early into the phrase. So we have A, C, E, and A. That's another A minor chord, no need to reanalyze. And we know we're still in A minor because of this melodic minor fragment here in the alto, as F sharp is a passing tone. And then we have A, D, G sharp, and B. Very interesting here. This A is just a lower suspension, um, and we know what's really being implied here is a seven chord G sharp diminished. Now, with this A being in the bass, not 100% certain what to analyze this inversion wise because this A is a non chord tone and it's purely being used for suspension effect. It doesn't resolve until we get to this G here. We even get it reiterated again on the next beat. But this is one of those cases where we have A sort of functioning as a suspension or a pedal tone. And we know that A is just underneath the harmony that's actually happening above it, which is a diminished chord. Lots of diminished chords here. We've only seen one, oh, we've seen two five chords, both in cadential situations, and all other dominants have been seven chords. Pretty interesting. Oh, well, actually, this isn't really functioning like a dominant, even though it is a dominant chord technically, because it really it's sort of functioning as a, a gateway to the key of A minor. Then we get this interesting transitive harmony. But as you can see, seven is definitely being favored as the dominant quality chord of, of choice um, in this particular chorale. We then have A, E, A, and C, so the, the seven chord does resolve where we would expect it to, to A minor, and I do think this is where we go back to the key of F. This is now our median, our three chord. We have a passing seventh in the bass, and then we get F sharp, D, A, and D. So we still have F sharp, but we go to G natural rather than, we go to, rather than going to G sharp earlier, which makes me feel like um, either we're briefly visiting the key of G minor, or sorry, G major, um, I don't think we're visiting the key of G major. Um, I think we're just uh, tonicizing G minor here because we have the B flat here. This were a B natural like it were earlier. Oh no, this is a B natural. Well, 
Maybe we are, in fact, going to the key of G major, or tonicizing G major. It's quite possible. No, I'm going to say that we briefly visit the key of G major here. Sorry, I completely neglected the fact that this was a B natural here. So again, this is another example of why the harmony doesn't quite look like uh, J.S. Bach's harmony, because this isn't typically something that Bach would do in one of his chorales. We've seen some wacky modulations in the past, but mid-phrase modulations where he's visiting keys that aren't particularly the most relative to uh, the tonic that was implied at the beginning of the chorale is not something that Bach would usually do. We see interesting key relationships, we see modulations to distant keys, but something about the orientation of these keys is um, unique to this chorale. And perhaps other chorales that Bach or CPE Bach uh, composed that might have made it into the collection that I'm analyzing. So this is G, um, this is where I think we're going to the key of G major, I suppose. A minor now becomes our two chord. Then we have F sharp, D, A, and D, which is D major over F sharp. That's five, six, passing tone in the melody here. And then we get G major, which could be our tonic. However, this is an interesting case. I think this is not really our tonic, but rather functioning as a seven chord, because as you can see, this F sharp turns into F natural going down. So I think this is actually five of four, because this F natural implies the fact that G is functioning as a dominant. Um, this is a really interesting phrase. Maybe the modulation isn't even necessary here. It does feel like we have a two, five, one in G major though, now that I know that this is a B natural rather than it being a B flat. But this five of four should resolve to a C major chord, E, C, G, and C. It does. Four, six, which is where I think we go to the key of F major. It is now our five, six chord. C, E, G, and C also takes the chord and puts it in root position. It's interesting when we see chords uh, when their tones are changed, leaving the chord intact. Sometimes when we change the note, I'd actually hedge my bets and say the majority of the time when we change a note, we're left with an in uh, a non-intact uh, chord as a result. We get rid of the third and replace it with the root, then we have a thirdless triad, vice versa. Afterwards we get D, D, F natural, and C. Kind of an interesting chord here. We go from five to, I guess, some type of fifthless six chord, so this might be six, seven. Maybe these are accented non-chord tones, and what we're actually getting is another five chord here. Uh, but definitely a, a cadence on the unusual side. We have E, C, G, and B flat, which is C7 over E, that's 5, 6, 5. And then our imperfect authentic cadence in the key of F, of course, ends on 1, F major, F, C, F, and A. So this mid-phrase modulation, very interesting. It's like we sequence from A minor to G major, because we keep the B natural from earlier, and then we move to F. So we have like a sequence walking down from A to F in whole steps. But why he tonicizes G major rather than G minor is interesting. I mean, obviously G turns into the dominant of C. One could even look at this as a series of dominants, D major, G major, C major, and that's just the circle of fifths, tonicizing each subsequent notch on the circle of fifths until we get the dominant of F. You could even consider F a dominant because of how it's going to function next. We have F, C, F, and A, but instead of E natural, we have E flat here, which is implying for the same reason that this G is five of four, this F is also five of four. And then we go to B flat. So really this chain of five chords um, over the form of this chorale is interesting. We've gone from A minor through G, uh, D major, G major, F major, and that's gonna go to B flat major. If we went to E flat after that, that would be really cool. But unfortunately that's where the train ends and um, we're not modulating to the key of B flat here. We get another chromatic bass line, which means that 
I feel like there's some type of symmetry going on here between the second phrase of the B section and the second phrase of the A section. It's likely that's what's happening here because of the chords that are being chosen. But interestingly, we don't go to B flat major. I'm just realizing this now. We have a deceptive secondary progression. We have five of four going to B flat D, sorry, B, fl B flat, B flat, D, and G. That's G minor over B flat, which is a two six chord in the key of F. Very interesting. So five of four going to two six is the same thing as in terms of B flat saying 5 going to 6. So that's what I mean by secondary deceptive progression. The lower three voices are more or less where you would expect the voices to resolve to from the 5 of 4 chord, but instead of resolving to F in the melody, we get G. And the melody is mostly intact. I would imagine that this melody is largely unmodified. That's sort of the point of the chorale, right? Is that the melody is being harmonized. So after our secondary deceptive progression, we get an intermediary chord between our five chord as we prepare for the cadence. We have B natural, A flat, D, and F. And this is another secondary seven chord. This is B fully diminished, which is seven of five, because B is the leading tone to C, and C is our five. And that's exactly where we go, C, G, C, and F. This F, of course, being a 4-3 suspension over the bass. We know that five is being implied, though. The bass leaps down an octave, the, the, the melody resolves down by step, and we get some embellishment going on here in the tenor, both non-chord tones, this B flat being a seventh. And then our perfect authentic cadence in the key of F ends with F, F, A, C, and F. All right, next phrase. Very interesting. We start in the key of F, and then I think we move to the key of D minor. Perhaps there's an argument to be made here that we start in the key of D minor. I mean, after all, we start with an A major chord. Why would we be in the key of F? Well, for me, I hear this phrase in uh, about to the halfway point in the key of F because ultimately that's where it feels like the harmony resolves. But there is an argument to be made here that we spend the entire time in the key of D. And if I was given, you know, five seconds to do a once over of this phrase and just use what's based on the score, uh, or just evidence from the score to tell me what key this phrase was in, I probably wouldn't say that we were in F and then we went to D minor. I would see this C sharp here and just assume we were in D minor the whole time. But after listening to it, it sounds like we stay in F and this is just a secondary dominant. Of course, like I said, you can make the argument that we are in the key of D minor the whole time. I think both analyses are accurate. Regardless, the phrase ends with a half cadence, and this A major chord here, C sharp, A, E, and A, is 5, 6 of 6, because A is the dominant of D, and D is our 6 in the key of F major. We also have a passing 7th in the melody here. D, A, F, and F is our 6 chord, D minor, passing 7th in the bass. Then we get B flat, D, F, and G, that's G minor 7 over B flat, 2, 6, 5. As you can see here, 6 to 2, 6, 5. It's a normative progression. It's a cadential progression, but we're going to see here that Bach turns it around. Um, 2, 6, 5. The C is a non-chord tone. The C is also a non-chord tone. This E is a non-chord tone. And with the G as well, this is a 5 chord C major, 2, 6, 5 to 5. Very staple cadential progression. We actually saw this exact same, almost exactly the same. The alto and the tenor are switched here, but basically the same progression at the end of the first phrase, and we end our cadential progression here with F, F, C, F, and A, which is our tonic triad in root position. And in the key of D minor, like we saw earlier, or rather, we went to the key of A minor where we got a three chord, similar to how we went to the key of A minor here. Um, we're going to be going to the key of D minor through a three chord, F major, this A also takes the chord and puts it in first inversion, again, leaving us with an intact chord just like we have here. And then we have B natural. So this is really what fully spells out D minor for me is this ascending melodic minor going on here from beat four to beat one, B, D, F, and G. This is G seven 
over B, which is a harmonization of the melodic minor scale. That's 4, 6, 5 in the key of D minor. This C sharp non chord tone, this E, or both of these E's where the alto and the tenor are actually singing the same pitch for this eighth note here. C sharp, E, E, and G. That's C sharp diminished. 4 going to 7 is a good sign. Sometimes we see 5 here, sometimes we see 7. Either way, 4 going to some type of dominant over a subdivision of the harmonic rhythm is relatively common in Bach. So whether this was J.S. Bach or whether it was C.P.E. Bach, um, definitely seeing some tropes that are similar in the harmonic patterns between the two. And then we would expect this to go to A minor, uh, sorry, A minor. I was just thinking about A minor earlier. No, D minor, D, A, E, and F. But this is probably the most interesting part of the chorale. This is wild. And I think this is the most, or I guess the strongest evidence to suggest that this chorale postdates Bach, most likely. Uh, D, A, E, and F. We know that our tonic's being implied here, but in typical Bach fashion, the bass changes but not the way that we would expect. We would expect Bach to change the bass and eventually have it resolve, you know, maybe to like a 1-6 chord a beat later. But check this chord out. B flat, G sharp, D, and F. What type of chord is this? Well, B flat is our 6, or I guess our flat 6. Uh, D is our 1. F is our 3. And G sharp is our sharp 4. And if you've ever taken harmony before, you probably already know this chord. This is an augmented six chord, and we're getting it as a resolution or a, a false resolution to a suspension where Bach uh, like subverts our expectations and gives us a German augmented six chord. Now, the reason why I think that this is most likely um, a chorale that postdates Bach is that, well, we. I have seen German augmented six chords in Bach before. Chances are they're very, they're more common in his instrumental music or his other vocal music, but I think I've only seen one or two other augmented six chords in all of the chorales, and I don't know if those are the chorales that have made it into the collection that weren't actually composed by J.S. Bach. Um, and I think that's super fascinating that we get an augmented six chord. I think it's typically indicative of a harmonic development that occurs later into the common practice period. I could be wrong. There could be augmented six chords used during Bach's lifespan. I mean, after all, there was classical music that was being composed. And when I say classical music, I don't mean just uh, Bach, you know, a colo like uh, colloquially speaking, Bach composed classical music, right? Western European art music, which everyone refers to as classical music, even though most cultures have a classical music. It's just Western Europe kind of owns the term now for whatever reason that might be. Um, whether that's right or wrong, it's mostly wrong, but that's besides the point. Um, I lost my train of thought. Uh, Bach was a composer during the Baroque period of the common practice period. So we'll say that Bach was a composer of classical music in the sense that, you know, there's performance practice, there's tradition typically associated with the aristocracy. Um, but he composed in an era of Western classical music called the Baroque. So as a Baroque composer, I would think that this German augmented six chord would probably be a development later in his lifespan. I don't think when Bach first started composing it was something that was commonplace. Of course, that's largely speculative and based loosely on my um, rough uh, understanding of Western European music history, but seeing an augmented six chord, truly fascinating and probably the strongest piece of evidence that this chorale was not composed by Bach because amongst the other harmonic choices that were made in this chorale, um, something is just not quite there. There is some overlap. This person, if they did study Bach, did know what was going on, right? Because of, you know, the 16761, um, the deceptive suspension, um, secondary deceptive progression, right? There are things that are hallmarks of Bach's chorales that very well might be codified. I haven't studied anybody else's chorales to say that it hasn't been um, done before or done by his contemporaries, but seeing an augmented six chord 
definitely fascinating, pretty wonderful too. Uh, but we're getting ready for our half cadence here. We have A, A, D, and F. That's our tonic triad and second inversion. We then get G sharp, B, D, and F. Interesting how we have this interruption of a 1, 6, 4 going to 5, right? We would expect our cadence, well, it's a half cadence, so we know it ends on some type of dominant chord, A, A, C sharp, and E. But it's being interrupted by 7 fully diminished of 5, right? Because we have G sharp, B, D, and F natural. So um, we have sort of this broken bracket here to show that they're related to one another, but we do get a change in harmony, or at least an analyzable change in harmony, where uh, a chord progression might be happening. I think it's happening, especially because the bass is changing, but um, the fact that a 5 chord is being preceded by a, a, one of its dominants, it's a uh, I think too much of a coincidence to not analyze. But we're going to stay in the key of D minor for the last phrase. We end with a minor chord. This is kind of a weaker piece of evidence, but we know that with minor chorales, Bach typically ends with a major chord. Um, the Picardy third is really important at the end of Bach's chorales that are in minor keys overall. The fact that this chorale ends in minor is a comment on the fact that this chorale is in the minority, in the vast minority that is. You can go through pretty much every single chorale that is in a minor key that J.S. Bach composed and you can pretty much bet on the fact that it's going to be a major chord at the end, but there are a handful of them that end with minor chords and the fact that this one doesn't as well with the rest of, uh, you know, corroborated with the rest of the evidence. You know, it's likely that uh, Bach didn't compose this, I think. But uh, with that being said, this is also the plainest of the phrases, which is kind of interesting as well. D, A, D, and F is a tonic triad. Typically, half cadences resolve to some type of tonic or stable functioning chord. We then have E, G, D, and G. This D is a 7-6 suspension over the bass. C sharp, E, and G is a 7-6 chord. C sharp diminished over E. And that goes to D minor over F. F, A, D, and F. So 1, 7, 6, 1. Definitely a progression that uh, if C.P. Bach composed this, or didn't comp I guess he did compose this chorale, of course. This is composition, but more specifically, he harmonized this melody. Um, this is something that uh, carried over a generation. Pretty cool stuff. We also have a passing tone in the bass, and here we have a pretty typical ending. This D is a 4-3 suspension over the bass, A, A, and E. We're outlining a 5 chord here, A major. Then we get the resolution on the next beat, A, A, C sharp, and E. Delayed 7th here with this G natural. And then we cadence on D minor, D, F natural, A, and D. Tonic triad, root, position. All in all, super fascinating chorale. Has a unique profile to it in terms of the keys that were chosen, um, the chords that were chosen. Definitely more chromaticism than I'm expecting than I'm expecting to see in the average Bach chorale, especially a standalone chorale. So I'm going to be a little bit more um, conscientious of the fact that Bach might be choosing or sorry, where was I going with that? I had two thoughts that were going on at the same time there. The thing about uh, chorales that make it into the collection that may not have been composed by Bach, I need to be more particular about those because they might have interesting harmonic quirks that make it pretty obvious that they weren't composed by Bach and the fact that they're are experts that suggest that this chorale is likely composed by one of Bach's children, in this case CPE, um, means that, you know, maybe I can throw in my two cents and speculate why the harmony may be an indicator of that. And I really do think the harmony could be an indicator. Lots of interesting things going on. But with all that being said, thank you so much for watching the video and supporting the channel by doing so. Um, I look forward to tomorrow's analysis, and I hope you take care.